It's Boom or Bust, Season 1, Episode 9. The show where you submit subwoofer designs, I 3D print them, and we play some head-to-head -to, -head to see whose is the loudest. Now, today's episode features a very interesting enclosure submitted by Travis. Thank you very much, Travis. At first glance, this might look a bit strange to many of you, as it did me. We have what looks like a regular slot-ported enclosure. However, instead of the driver being mounted to one of the faces so it can radiate outside and inside of the box. We have it mounted to the port. So the front of the driver radiates into the start of the port here, and the back of the driver radiates into the air chamber behind it. Now, Travis said in his email submission, the design is based off an idea I've been thinking about for quite some time. The basic concept is based off a slot port fourth order box, but instead of having the woofer mounted on the outside of the box, I decided to place the woofer on the inside of the port. The idea behind this is theft deterrence, but I have never implemented the idea due to not knowing how it would perform. He says the full size box was based off a 12 inch woofer with a tuning frequency around 32 to 35. And he called the STL file fifth order. Now I've had a pretty busy week trying to get this episode sorted and I haven't really researched much about fifth orders. I'm not really an enclosure design guru as such. I'm sure Hexibase will have plenty more to tell you about whether fifth orders are a thing and how they work than I will. So I'll let you do your own research to see whether this is actually a fifth order or whether this is just a regular ported box with the woofer mounted in the wrong place. But we'll see how it performs. I thought it was very interesting and I wanted to see what happened. Now I thought this episode was actually going to be postponed for much longer than it has been. If you saw my community post on YouTube, you will have seen that my laptop seems to have died along with my Dayton Dats V2. So without the laptop and without the Dayton Dats V2, there was no boom or bust because I couldn't do the impedance sweep or anything like that. There's other ways I could have done the impedance sweep, but I had a method of my workflow and I didn't really want to try changing it up and making things different for you. I wanted every episode to, to be as, as much the same as possible. So it's very easy to compare graphs between these episodes and performance between these episodes. Lucky for me, I am a component level repair technician so I can get the laptop sorted. I've already discovered what appears to be the bad components. Same for the Dats V2. I think it's just a strange coincidence they died at the same time. They weren't even plugged into each other and the faults have nothing to do with one another. Just bad luck. They both happened at the exact same time. But I've been very fortunate in that someone has kindly lent me their Dayton Dats V3 so we can get this episode underway. So you know who you are. Thank you so much for letting me borrow this while I get mine sorted. So now that's out of the way, let's drop a top on this. I'm going to put a Perspex top on it to start with just so we can see the woofer moving while I do some analysis and then I'll put the 3D printed final top on it when we do the testing but obviously I can't see it then so but I'm very curious to see what the impedance sweep looks like and what it actually sounds like out here open in the room as well. Okay so the good news is it has an impedance dip with two spikes either side of it lending to the fact that it may have a Helmholtz mode that's actually going to do something here. The first impedance spike down here is at 113 hertz. That's fine. That's well below all the frequencies we're testing. So fully unloaded, no problem, up at 10.8 ohms. Now the impedance valley here, the dip, is at 175 hertz. We're down at 5.4 ohms, which is still quite a bit higher than this woofer's nominal impedance. So we've still got a fair bit of rise going on there. So not a great deal of cone loading from the enclosure. Now that is smack bang in the middle of the two lowest frequencies that we test 150 and 198 if we look at where 150 is we're sort of halfway up this slope down to the impedance peak so the 150 hertz up at 7.2 ohms and the next frequency we test 198 is very close to this second impedance spike um, up at 6.9 ohms so I think we're going to get a fair bit of cone displacement going on at those two lower frequencies the next two frequencies up the 270 and the 360 have much less less impedance rise um, so we're probably going to go all the way up to 15 watts on those if we can't on the block bottom two we might but we might not be able to interestingly there is another relatively pronounced impedance spike up at 866 hertz here and another one up at 1700 hertz so about double so those are definitely quarter wave modes of some kind whether that is a mode of this being like a line like a kind of t-line style enclosure here or whether it's just just modes back and forth bouncing between the two parallel edges not too sure we'd have to measure it and see but yeah pretty interesting and I, although I don't necessarily think this is gonna be the loudest box we've tested I think it's still going to actually produce some reasonable output and I'm not convinced that it's gonna be the worst performer here either so it might actually do something kind of cool next thing to do is hook it up on the amplifier and see exactly what it sounds like so what does 150 Hertz sound like 
Oh, okay. It's definitely a lot of harmonics, a lot of distortion on the fundamental there, and there's also a lot of chuffing, there's a lot of port noise. It's like very... <sighs> also, it sounds like we reached mechanical excursion limit at about 9 watts there, so yeah, we won't be able to make it all the way up to the full 15, unless this cabin adds some additional loading to the driver, which I don't know if it will in this configuration here. 198 hertz, which scales to 33. It doesn't sound much better either. It's, it kind of sounds like... <laughs> it's got a proper nasal kind of tone to it. With the added chuffing, it definitely sounds like a nose, a nose tone. 270 now. Still quite a lot of like turbulent kind of sounds, like air movement sounds, definitely loads of it. What is that? I'm sorry, what is that? <laughs> it plays a chord! What? Sorry, what? I have to get it all the way up to 20 watts in order to get it to do that, but beyond a certain level where I push it quite hard, the woofer obviously unloads or loses control in such a way that it farts a chord out, like a lower harmonic of that tone. Oh wow, that was quite a lot of power. That was 30 watts I just saw on here, so we probably shouldn't do that for too long. The driver won't be lasting. But that's hilarious either way. Does it? I want to see if it does it on the uh, 360 as well. Is it 360? Okay, that's the cleanest one so far, which makes sense because it's far furthest away from what the box is kind of going to be adding to the driver. Okay, no cord on 360, just on 270. <laughs> Yeah, it's not very loud, uh, but it is cleaner than the others. I'm just going to go back to this 270 and see if the power spikes when the cord comes in. Yeah, we add, as soon as that lower note comes in, it adds about 10 watts. So that means that the driver, the movement of the driver must be changing in such a way that the impedance absolutely plummets when that strange excursion thing happens and causes that tone. So on Room EQ Wizard, interestingly, the kind of fundamental shape of the sine wave actually looks cleaner than some others that we have actually seen, but it just sounds worse to the ear. Very strange how that happens, but as you can see, right up to the mechanical excursion limit of the woofer, it does start looking horrible. And there are also some signs of the white noise, the kind of chuffing sound overlaid on top of the sine wave there. It's not a great shape anyway to start with, but it actually does look a little bit less harmonic than some of the other ones we've seen before. Moving up to 198 hertz, it's much, much cleaner. It's much louder here at this frequency as well. And again, although it sounded pretty bad in person, it doesn't look too rough of a sine wave shape. It has more of a triangle shape to it though, like a triangle wave. It's very sharp at the bottom and the top with a relatively steep slope in the middle. And that may cause this nasal kind of sound that I'm hearing in person. With 270, this is going to be interesting. We have a okay-ish looking shaped sine wave to start with, but we all know what's coming above that certain power limit. Yeah, crazy distortion added, and interestingly, it's not to every pulse, it's almost like every other pulse, so that tells me that this is a harmonic that is exactly half the frequency that we're playing, the fact that we've got this kind of added spike on the top of the sine wave, notice how it's just on the top of the sine wave, but it's every other peak, that means that that frequency is half the one that we're actually playing. And lastly, the 360 hertz looks relatively smooth up to a point, but then it starts leaning forward like it's kind of leaning in for a good old smell. And right at the limit, you see evidence of the harmonic coming in there. The RTA graph shows the 150 hertz standing proud with obviously lots of harmonics coming in, but we don't have the secondary harmonic overtaking the fundamental like we have seen in previous boxes. So the, the fundamental is still the strongest frequency here. Same story with 198, where you can see how much louder it is just at this power level, even on the RTA mic. And then our friend the 270, fundamental looks okay up to a point we've got a pretty heavy secondary, but yeah, then that, whoa, we have the half harmonic just appear out of nowhere. Yeah, it is exactly half of the fundamental. And the 360, yeah, pretty standard. The second harmonic is quite strong though, compared to other boxes we've seen. <laughs> so yeah, definitely one of the funniest sounding enclosures we've had on the season so far. Uh, now let's throw this in the cabin and have a listen to some bass demos. We're going to play some tracks sped up by a factor of six and then slow down again in editing so you can hear what they would sound like if this box was scaled up.
you, but it wasn't sounding that loud here in the room during those demos, and it didn't look particularly loud when I was filming it either, but the meter will tell us the full story here as to what's going on. Whether it's loud, maybe it's just one specific frequency, or whether it's quiet across the range. Let's have a look then. We're going to play 25 scaled hertz first, which is 150 hertz in real life. Cabin door open. Let's go. What's this weird box got to give? Okay, that was pretty much unloaded. I could hear the driver there just starting to give away. We got 136.6 dBs at 25 scaled hertz. Not the worst we've seen, I don't think, so fair play. 33 scaled hertz being a 198. This is on the way up to the second impedance spike. So we can go all the way up to 15 watts. There we are, and a 136.3, so pretty flat across the board with these two frequencies. Next up, 45 scaled hertz, this is a 270. Oh my days. Wow, this has got to be the quietest one we've ever seen so far. 117.4. I'm just curious whether we give it 30 watts and it brings in that chord, whether it suddenly gets louder. <laughs> 2 dBs up. And 60 scaled hertz, this is a 360. And a 118.5. Ah, uh, door closed now, then I guess. 124.3. A 129. A 115. And a 117. A little bit louder there, the 60 with the door closed. So, where does that place the travesty? That's the name I'm calling it. On the leaderboard, then. Unfortunately, we don't even make our way onto boom status at all. With a 127.2 average with the door open and a 121.53 average with the door closed. Sadly, this box makes its way straight into bust status. I love the idea behind this. I love people experimenting, coming up with ideas in their head, wondering whether it's gonna work in real life. Sometimes those things work, sometimes they don't. And this case is an example of one that maybe just didn't work out. I think that if you wanted to build an enclosure that doesn't have the driver on show for security purposes, perhaps, then it's better to go with a fourth order or a series tune sixth order. Those have very good and well documented documented performance and you don't see the driver from the outside of the box. But although it didn't make its way onto our leaderboard here, it was definitely making some bass. It was doing something. We got some camera shake from the demo content and it did move the sheet a little bit in the window there. Just not as much as other enclosures, but it was still doing something, which is interesting. I've got plenty more enclosures where that came from. Some that I think are definitely going to perform well, some that I'm not too sure about like this one, but I want to test anyway because they're different, they're interesting, the ideas are out there and I think that's what this series is all about. So now I've got the equipment sorted out, albeit the laptops from like 2001. I can start doing these episodes twice a week again, so expect another episode on Wednesday, hopefully. And if you want to have a go designing an enclosure that you think can get onto boom status or maybe even break the 140 dB average mark, then feel free to submit a design. All the details are in the video description to the instructions, tiers, parameters, box volumes, etc. that you'll need to know to submit a design. Also, if you're interested in sponsoring this series in any Anyway, with like a sticker on the cabin, sponsored message or segment in these videos, then drop me a message as well. There's an email just in the description. Once again, thank you so much for all the support and responses to my little community message showing that my equipment was dead and we wouldn't have boomer bus for a while. The response was incredible and uh, you're all very, very kind and very generous. And it's great to see that you're enjoying this series so much that you're willing to help me out to get this uh, up and running again. And for those interested in the repair content, I will probably make some video or some live stream or something repairing the laptop top and also the dats v2 in case you're interested but until then hope you have a great rest of the week and i'll see you in the next episode